So let's have a little look at where stress sits. Stress is a buzzword. A lot of people use stress as an excuse for certain things. But actually, stress tends to be a reaction in our brain to something. And as such, we often think that stress is a negative thing. But pl time plays a really big role when it comes to stress. And where you sit in time plays a role as well. For example, if you are experiencing stress, which is based in the past, then that's known as depression. But stress which is based in the future, something that's coming up, is anxiety. And the thing is, employees often will tell you that they are suffering from depression or feeling depressed, or that they're feeling anxious or suffering from anxiety. And they may well be based on their ideal as to what that is. But always remember that as employers and human beings, these are medical conditions. And as such, really only a GP or a doctor can diagnose someone as being depressed or suffering from anxiety. So we've got to think about the symptoms that create it before someone gets to this extreme level. Does that make sense? Yeah? And we need to be able to control it a little bit. As such, there's a lot of stuff that we do in our day that actually contributes towards stress and we need to minimise some of this. Um, caffeine plays a big role in stress. It gets us going. It's a coping mechanism that we have in our life. Um, I know, for one, I can't deal without caffeine, and I'm pretty horrible without it. I'm sure some of you are as well. But caffeine plays a big role in contributing to stress. Sugar, we now know, sugar is a really bad thing, isn't it? There was a thing on Jamie Oliver last week. We know that sugar is the new enemy, and sugar plays a big role in our coping mechanisms. If you think about the way that people work throughout a day, they get up in the morning, we're told in our Western culture that we need to have cereals for breakfast, and cereals are just carbohydrates which turn into sugar, when actually protein is probably a better option for us for breakfast, because that's what our brain needs. But in the 11 o'clock in the morning, we get a little bit of a low, don't we? So we reach for a cake or a croissant or something. 12 o'clock comes round, we reach for carbohydrates and sandwiches. At 2 o'clock, we get a 2 o'clock crash, so we get a bar of chocolate. 4 o'clock is even worse. Then it's cake time again. And then 6 o'clock, we go home and make friends with the fridge. And that's what we do. And I know people, and I'm sure you might be the same, who can't even get through the door without taking their coat off without getting a piece of cheese in their mouth. Yeah. I do it. Come on, you do it, you do it, you do it. And then the wine, I get it, it's all good. But we've got all of that. Um, just generally feeling unhappy or stressed about something can contribute, but these things also make a massive difference to our stress as well. And this concept of blue light, as they call it, is very important and a massive contributor to stress and anxiety. The blue light is what these devices give off. They keep us awake and they stimulate things in our brain. And we need to be aware of them. Because ultimately, what we need to be thinking about when it comes to stress is this concept of frequency, intensity and duration. In other words, how often does it happen, how bad is it when it does happen and how long will it last when it does? And if we can get a handle on those things, then what we can do is we can start to predict when stress is going to happen and if it's a good thing. We can predict it because often we work in repeated patterns of things within our job, don't we? We get the same things happen over and over again. I know that when I set up for a training course, and if I've got a lot of them, I have to go through a process to get the training course put together. If I leave it to the last minute, then consequently I'll go mad because I'm, I'm not in control. But because I know how to do this, I know that the frequency of the stress in actually making it happen happens at certain times. It lasts for about two to three hours within a day whilst I'm getting it ready because my home just looks like a mess and my home office just goes into chaos and there's a dog lost in there somewhere. And finally, its duration is not going to be that long, but as long as I can keep a handle on it, that's important. And this is where we look to stress to be a good thing or to be a bad thing and to manage it in terms of these three things. There's someone who wrote about stress, who really gets stress, and his name is Hans Selye, S-E-L-Y-E. Hans Selye drowned thousands of rats in the search for finding out how we become stronger within stress. And he's got some really cracking stuff, and he created this thing called General Adaptation Syndrome. And that's the point at which stress is applied, and then there's a point where you get very exhausted from too much. And the bit in between is where you try and adapt to it, where you try and cope. 
And it's that bit that Cellier says is really good. Because if you can control that through the frequency, intensity, and duration of it, then as such, stress can become a little bit more easier to cope with. So stress has got a lot going for it, and there's a lot you need to be thinking about. I've got a lot of stuff on stress again. If you want it, go to the website, download it, take it all for free. It's all there. Then we look at this concept of people management. How many of you employ people? How many of you employ people? You've got people? How many people are we talking about in your teams? What have we got? Ten, five, four. Yeah, okay. So within this, we need to be able to understand the type of person and per on personality and capability that they've got. And it's really important to understand them at a very intrinsic level. Understand what motivates them. Understand what gets them out of bed. Understand their personality. Try and get them to do some form of personality profile if that helps so you understand what fits in your team. All of those types of things. Talk to them. Get to know them. Create performance management mechanisms because often when you run a small business, a lot of people that I work with have employed people either that they know or people that are friends and family that they have known. And as such, what happens is they tend to absolve their management responsibility because they feel everything will be fine because they know them anyway. But when something goes wrong, then they find that actually they haven't got the robust performance management systems in place. And one thing we do know is that employees are getting more and more litigious and they have more and more rights. So as such, we've got to protect those employees and we need to protect our businesses as well. And that means we've got to be able to manage them fairly and properly because they're entitled to be treated that way and you are entitled to have fair and good people in your business. We've got to foster development, motivation and ownership, and that's through giving them regular appraisals and feedback. And you've got to protect yourself, as I've said. So you need to be able to learn to delegate and set objectives. And I know that from being a business owner myself, the control freak in me is there. I acknowledge it. It's a friend. It sits there. We like to hold on to everything, don't we? But we do need to let things go. And setting objectives and delegating in the management world is ultimately the same thing. It's the same thing. It's just getting people to do stuff. One of them is by imposing, which is delegating, and the other one is by mutual agreement, which is setting objectives. And we do need to be able to remember that we've got to delegate authority, but we cannot delegate responsibility. That stays with you as the business owner and manager. So you can give as much authority to do stuff away as possible, but the responsibility for it lies with you. Yeah? Is that clear? Do you make, does that make sense? It's a, it's a really clear distinction that we need to make. And as there are so many different people that are out there, we need to be able to have a system that works very well for them. I'm sure you've all heard of SMART objectives, have you? Yeah? SMART objectives. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-bound. You can add the ER on the end. The E is effect. What effect will this objective have on someone on, and impact the rest of their job? And then lastly, the R is review period or reward. And this review period relates directly to the time bound element. Because when you give someone an objective, you can say to them, I want you to do this and it needs to be done by the 1st of June. But I think you also need to check in to make sure they're on track just in case you need to change the goalposts a little bit or if they want to change the goalposts. It also keeps your employees reminded of what they're supposed to be doing as well. Because often you can set them objectives and then if they're poor time managers, they'll just leave it all to the last minute, which people like to do. They like to procrastinate. So we need to think about that. So the smarter thing works really, really well. Here's the other thing. This is kind of the balance to it. As a trainer, when I train people in management, I have to give them this. But I give them a balanced side of it as well. Because if you've got, let's say one of you said you had 10 employees, if you set them, say, five objectives, that means you've got to create 50 smarter objectives. And that can take an awful long time. If you've got that time, then great. But if you haven't, then the shortcut to that is just to ask yourself, what needs to be done, who needs to do it, and when's it got to be done by? That kind of keeps it nice and brief and nice and easy. And that way, it's more manageable. When it comes through to actually go putting someone through performance management, where they're not performing and you need to get a bit serious with them, then you might want to engage this because it's more robust. So you've got two approaches. 
If you find that delegation is something you need help with, then you might want to use SMARTO as a tool. And SMARTO is a nice way to look at delegating that stops you from using the the opportunity word when you delegate. Because a lot of managers will ask staff to do something and they'll say, I want you to do this and it's a really good opportunity for you to develop. And what they're really saying is, um, this is a job I don't want to do that I want you to do, but I'll call it an opportunity. That's what I'll call it as a development thing. But Smarto makes it a little bit more robust and Smarto works backwards. So what you do, <coughs> is you ask yourself, first of all, is when I delegate something, what's the outcome or the objective? What's the point of me getting rid of this thing I need to do? What's the outcome for it? Secondly, when do I need it done by, which is the time element? The R is the resources. What resources are, am I going to offer them to help them get the job done? The A is how much authority am I going to give them? Not responsibility. How much authority am I going to give them? The M is how am I going to measure that they're doing OK or monitor their progress? And the S is how much support am I going to give them? How much support am I going to give them? Am I going to give them a little bit of a helping hand? Am I going to give the, that support in to them in terms of micromanagement? In other words, I'm going to be sitting on their shoulder to get them to do this. Or am I going to give them a lot of autonomy? It just depends. So SMARTO works backwards the other way for delegation. SMARTER is for objective setting. Do you see the difference? Nice and easy, and they work really, really well. Thank you. We need to be thinking about sales management as well. Sales is very, very close to my heart. It's one of the things that I've, I've come from, and it's one of the biggest things that I train in businesses. There are lots of companies out there that train sales management, and if you're not a natural salesperson, then it's a really good idea to try and get as much selling experience and sales knowledge as you can under your belt. Understand ultimately where your business is coming from. Learn how to sell even if you hate it. A lot of people don't like selling. They don't like the concept of it. They don't like salespeople. But ultimately, when we run our own business, it's our revenue stream, it's our pipeline. We need to be able to do it. Remember that people buy people that they trust, they like, and they believe in, and people that ultimately will help them make money rather than just take money off of them. And we need to be aware of that so that when we sell to our customers, we capitalize on three key areas. And those three areas are resonation, differentiation, and substantiation. In other words, I want you to want what I've got to sell. I want you to see that I'm the only option that you should choose. And I want you to believe in me. And if you can get each of those three key areas in place, you will minimize the number of, of, of objections that you get back. There's some fantastic writing that's just come out of the USA where most sales training comes from. And I get to read a lot of this and I test it with my clients and test it with companies that I work with. Um, it's two guys called Schultz and Dewar, um, Dewar is D-O-E-R-R, -R, have just written a book called The Insight Sale. And the insight sale is great for people who don't necessarily like selling because what it does is it helps you understand how to get your customers to resonate with what you're offering, either from a technical perspective, so that they look at what you're doing going, yeah, do you know what, what you've got would fit with our business, or from an emotional level where they go, do you know what, I really like you and I get you and I think you could work really well with our business. And if you can get that bit right, that's great. Then the differentiation comes in, your USP, and then support and believing it, the substantiation. And this is where your customers think about their experience, their own customer experience with you, and they advocate you. Advocacy is the holy grail within sales because ultimately what you're doing is saying, don't take my word for it, look at the other customers that I've worked with, look at the other people that have worked with me and look at what they say. You should use things like LinkedIn to harvest those particular recommendations and get as many recommendations as you can on LinkedIn. Then what you do is you farm those across to your website and start populating your website on your pages with these testimonials and then you feed them into your sales proposals or presentations that you give to your clients so that you've got a consistent approach to your advocacy. This makes a real difference and it shows evidence and substantiation. It's a good thing to do. And don't be frightened to ask for them either. If you get on well with your customers, they will do it for you. They're very happy to do it. And also, they would want you to do it for them too. 
LinkedIn's a bit sneaky because what LinkedIn does is it says, okay, someone's written one for you, and then once, you, once they've written it, it says to you, are you ready to reciprocate? Are you ready to do one in return? And I quite like that because it's a quite a nice thing to do. So we want to be thinking about our customers and their experience. We want to be able to do more than just delight our customers. We want to do more than that. We want to create devoted customers. I'm not sure how you go about delighting a customer. When you think about the word delight, what does that, I don't think I've ever gone anywhere. I've had good service, but I don't know I've come away going, I feel delighted. I don't think I've ever had that. Um, but I just want to create a sense of devotion, or in some cases, I like to feel quite relieved that I'm dealing with someone. I like to know that I'm in good hands. And if you offer a service that's built on security, then sometimes your customers want to feel, I trust this, and that's great. I've just engaged a web designer to redesign my website. But do you know what? The language that he talks goes into what I call my virtual too hard tray. And the too hard tray means I don't care about it, I don't want to care about it, or I just can't deal with it right now. But the good thing with Lawrence is that he just takes it all away. And everything he talks to me about, he always follows it up by saying, don't worry about it, I've got it, I'm just keeping you on the loop on things. So I can just walk away and go, it's great, it's fine. Once it's done, don't need to worry about it. And I think that's the type of customer experience we want to be able to offer our customers, that sense of relief. If you think about it, your customers will have an experience and they will have an expectation. And if you multiply the expectation and experience together, you get the type of customer. So if you get a customer that's got a very low expectation on, your, on their experience and you deliver a poor experience, well, you did exactly what they hoped, didn't you? They thought you were crap and you were. So therefore, you delivered. So that's good. And that's it. Or you can have a customer that's got a really low expectation but gets a really good experience, in which case they're very happy, yeah? Or you could get someone that's got a high expectation and gets a very poor experience and they're a dissatisfied customer. You need to watch those. Those are toxic customers. Those are the ones that will put things on LinkedIn and on Twitter about you. If people are taking photographs of their food and saying how lovely it is, they are taking photographs of their food and saying how crap it is as well. And they're doing it about other businesses. I train a lot of companies now who need a social media presence on how to deal with customer complaints because people get very brave on social media and like they do on email. It's different, so we need to be able to cope with that. But if you've got a customer experience where they've got a very high expectation and they get a really, really good experience, you create customer devotion because they knew it was going to be good, they hoped it was going to be good, and you were, and you really delivered, and that's really important. And how do you go about delivering? You deliver the extra little bit that makes all the difference. So this is where you participate. Can you all take your right hand right now and push it up as far as you can? Up you go. Very nice, lovely. Now push it two inches further. Why didn't you do that in the first place? Because we're comfortable and we're lazy. We're naturally lazy, we'll just do what the most basic thing is. But ultimately, what makes the difference to your customers is the extra two inches, and that's what you've got to give. If you don't give any more than that, you're just going to get the customer who goes, yeah, it was what it was. So always make sure you go to give a little bit more. Ultimately, that's where you're going to find value being delivered. Getting additional help, you must never ever feel that you're alone. They all talk to each other. You've got these fantastic co-working hubs that you've got together. You should listen to your people. Ideally, you should use the self-coach approach that I showed you just now, or engage a coach. Engaging a coach is great. There's lots of them out there, and they're very, very good. I will give you one word of advice. As someone who's bought coaches for other people, always make sure that if you're going to get a coach, audition a number of them. Don't just go for the first one. Audition them and see which one fits best with you and that you resonate with, that get you. And remember that when you have a coaching session with a coach or a mentor, it's not just a happy chat. They're going to challenge you and they're going to push you. You're not paying for someone just to sit there and have a nice talk to you. It needs to challenge and stretch you. So always think about that. Ask yourself planning question, those five planning questions. Contact me if you want some help. There's loads of free stuff and stuff that I can give you. Or you can just go to my website. Very simple.